Positive health requires a knowledge of man's primary constitution and of the powers of various foods, both those natural to them and those resulting from human skill. But eating alone is not enough for health. There must also be exercise, of which the effects must likewise be known. If there is any deficiency in food or exercise, the body will fall sick. Hippocrates, 480 B.C. Chances are your grandmother did a pretty good job of feeding her family. But did you ever stop to think how easy her job was in comparison to your own? Grandmother's meals consisted of simple foods produced on the family farm, prepared in the family kitchen and served in the natural state. Today it's different. Foods are refined, processed, bleached. The old-fashioned foods have lost important minerals and vitamins. Over the past 60 years, the American public has taken unwitting part in a great uncontrolled experiment as prepackaged and processed foods replaced fresh produce and home cooking. As the prevalence of chronic illnesses, most notably heart disease, began to rise, health experts set the country on an even more disastrous course. The low-fat, low-cholesterol diet, which introduced margarine and other hydrogenated vegetable oils in great amounts to the American diet. The result? Americans are more overweight than ever before, and obesity-related diseases are the second leading cause of death in the U.S. Over the past two decades, scientists from around the world have discovered that far from being bad for you, some fats are absolutely essential to our physical, mental, and even emotional well-being. What are called omega-3 fatty acids may be a major part of both the prevention and the cure of a host of devastating illnesses, ranging from heart disease to manic depression. Meet you. Very pleased to meet you. How are you? Very good. What a lovely place you have here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you Hi. Hi. Pleased nice to meet to you. you. I'm very excited to be here, and it's wonderful. In fact, one of the reporters from this area called me up in Washington and said, uh, why Medford? Why come here? I said, I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. Because the letter that Mr. McCune sent to me, it was one of the most warm, beautiful, intelligent letters I ever received. Mm -hmm. And it made such an impression that I thought it was very worthwhile to come and meet you in person. And your wife, of course. Mm -hmm. Is that you? That's me. I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah. How long ago? That was 1994. Yes. And it really, it's a picture really shows um, how large I was, but I was actually heavier um, in the last few years before the heart attack than I was there. And you look so, great now. Thank you. I would have never suspected. <laughs> you don't have to look back, you know, just forward. Just only. forward, yeah. What are the essential fatty acids? There are two families. One is called omega-6 and the other is called omega-3. During her long career as a physician and a researcher at the NIH, Dr. Artemis Simopoulos became fascinated by evidence that all fats are not the same. In the 1980s, uh, I was chair of the Nutrition Coordinating Committee of the National Institutes of Health. And at that time, there was quite a bit of research showing that all polyunsaturated fatty acids are not the same, that there are two different families, the omega-6 and the omega-3s. And there was a great deal of research from Europe, Japan, and the United States on the beneficial effects of omega-3 fatty acids from fish and fish oils in normal development, in cardiovascular disease, in patients with arthritis and other forms of inflammation. So this, this is the second grade and then continued on in the third grade and on to the fourth grade and then on and on and on. On and on and on. Yeah, I just kept getting bigger. I guess for a lot of, I felt like I was just meant to be fat for some reason. I was overweight all my life. People would say, you're just a husky boy. 
He was a fat boy. <laughs> Greg's incredible weight loss and amazing overall recovery have made him the poster boy for the local hospital's cardiovascular program. Now I exercise nearly every day. In this commercial, he can be seen choosing foods rich in omega-3 polyunsaturated fats and undergoing a regimented exercise program, the tenets of the omega diet. It's night and day from before. But it's a lot more than weight loss. Mm -hmm. It's really been healthy. Mm -hmm. And people, I think, should focus more on following a diet that keeps them healthy, mm -hmm. not just only weight loss, mm -hmm. because you can lose weight and still not feel healthy. What is more important is to maintain in a, in a state of health, both physically and mentally and emotionally. And, and that's what the diet is all about. Yeah, I really, really feel like it's a, a diet for health. Yeah, it's a complete lifestyle change. Yes. And it's, it's a wholeness to it. Do you know what are essential fatty acids? What are omega-6 and omega-3? Um, I believe I know where to go to find the correct ones. I couldn't describe or, you know, the technical terms, no. Okay, well, what is very important is that we need to balance our essential fatty acids in our diet. Now, they're called essential because the body does not make them and you have to get them from your diet. And there are two families, the omega-6 and omega-3. And right now, all Western diets, including the American diet, are extremely high in omega-6 fatty acids because vegetable oils such as corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, cottonseed oil, soybean, all the oils we're using are very high in omega-6. Um, during evolution, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 was 1. They were found in equal amounts. Corn oil has a ratio of 60 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. It's terrible. In the United States, in 1999, there were 5,733,000 ,00 metric tons of soybean oil produced. It takes 10 railroad tank cars to transport 1,000 metric tons. So it takes something like 500,000 tank cars to transport all of that oil. If you consider these oils to be drugs because they're bioactive compounds, that is a radical, a very unusual contribution uh, to the diet in, in America. Also, because the animals are grain-fed, the meat of cattle that's grain-fed has a lot of omega-6 and practically no omega-3, the same in the milk and in the cheese. So we have managed to develop a food supply that is very low or sometimes sort of deleted. We have deleted the omega-3 fatty acids. The omega-3 fatty acids are found in all green leafy vegetables, either cultivated or wild ones. They're found in walnuts, and in walnut oil. They are found in good amounts in canola oil. The ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in canola oil is 2 to 1. Flaxseed um, is very good. Uh, flaxseed oil is half omega-6, half omega-3. And of course, fish. Fish of all kinds. The fattier the fish, the more the omega-3. Tuna, herring, mackerel, salmon, saltwater over fresh, wild more than farmed, but fish in all their varieties. Fish eat the algae that, like its green counterpart on land, provide the original source of omega-3 fats. Fish then store these fats in great quantities and then serve them up to their ancient predators, human beings. Having been present in the human evolution for uh, millions of years, they uh, are most likely uh, one of the best possible approaches that we may have uh, to prevent cardiovascular disease just by putting back our dietary habits to what was the diet of our ancestors who knew very little or no cardiovascular disease at all. Even up to the time period of having the heart attack which was just over a year ago now, right. um, I was still on the wrong track. Um, we weren't making great efforts. Um, and it was really, honestly, the, the heart attack was the turning point, about face. Uh, my cardiologist really laid down a challenge. Uh, he said, if you don't change your lifestyle, your habits, you'll be in here again. And uh, then the motivation 
was fear. I have to say, initially, uh, was fear. He's on three liters. Uh, this is what Greg McCune is afraid of. This patient's artery has closed up again, and he's back for his second procedure. Mr. Knight, that, that stent, unfortunately, has closed down again. We have ways that we can, we can deal with re-narrowing or, or uh, re-occlusion re within a stent, but the best, the best approach, the best strategy is to not get this problem in the first place. When we deal with patients at this point, they usually already have established coronary disease, but we routinely recommend a Mediterranean-style diet to them in order to decrease the risk of future cardiac events and to decrease the rate of progression of the underlying um, atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, or the cholesterol accumulation in the arteries, can occur in any artery in the body. For reasons we don't know, they occur more often in the coronaries. And they cause these obstructions to occur, which heart muscle then dies because the blood supply is shut off. In 1968, Dr. Dudley Johnson pioneered the heart bypass procedure that today has become the standard. Now he is one of the leading proponents of omega-3 fatty acids as a way to avoid having the surgery in the first place. We could reestablish flow, but improving the plumbing does nothing for the basic cause of atherosclerosis. And I've been interested from the beginning in what we can do to our patients to help prevent the progression of this atherosclerotic process. Cholesterol is not the cause of atherosclerosis. The arteries are damaged, free radicals, irritating substances damage the lining of the arteries. And then once the artery is damaged, the cholesterol tends to get deposited in these injured areas. So the accumulation of cholesterol in an artery is one of the last stages in atherosclerosis. Uh, it's a factor, but it really does not injure the vessels. And more and more studies have indicated that the Omega-3 oils protect the lining of the arteries. Often we will see uh, people who embrace this diet, um, we'll see them start to lose weight as they become more active and, and more diet conscious. And uh, we'll see changes in uh, their triglycerides as they reduce, uh, reduce the bad kinds of saturated fats from their diets. Well, Greg, it's been a little over a year now since your um, heart trouble. How have you been feeling? Been feeling really great, heart-wise. I'm getting, uh, trying to get my regular exercise in and, and eating like I should. What is and, your regular exercise consistent uh, with? We are um, doing mainly walking for our exercise, brisk walking. We do uh, cardiac rehab maintenance programs still three days a week. The challenge Dr. Dino gave to Greg was straightforward. Follow the Omega diet and wear out a pair of tennis shoes as part of a carefully monitored exercise program, the other essential ingredient to a healthy heart. Okay, good. Sit up in the front. Well, seems like you're doing very well. Thank you. And I'm pleased. Tell me a little bit, how did you come about to feel that diet and the importance of fruits and vegetables and uh, fish and omega-3 fatty acids are, uh, are important because after all, he did have a normal cholesterol. To me, the greatest failure of medicine is to do a procedure and not alter all of those other factors which we know will lead to continued progressive disease. Greg took to heart his doctor's prescriptions for preventing a return to the operating room. Nevertheless, knowing what to eat is one thing. Putting that knowledge into practice is another. When shopping for food, there are many hidden pitfalls. Even when you know what you're looking for, labels can be misleading. I'm curious to see now what you have in your cupboards and your refrigerator. Sure. Let's see it. So, in the refrigerator, uh, which uh, has a variety of things, still condiments, but our salad dressings, yes. uh, we watch the labels very carefully so that uh, there is no oils other than canola or olive and here on this uh, this Caesar dressing actually the first item listed is canola oil and there's no hydro hydrogenated Good. oils listed or right. anything else. You know of course that when you see the word hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated this is a no no, a no because no. these are oils that have turned into trans fatty acids that raise 
um, your LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, yeah. while at the same time they lower the good. In fact, hydrogenate oils are worse than butter. And, and I see here, we only have as an example not to have it. It's a no-no. It's yeah. a no-no, and this is uh, canola harvest margarine because this is hydrogenated and it is solid. This is full of trans fatty acids. The trans fatty acids, they get right on every cell membrane in the body. They prevent the omega-3s from getting there, and they create all the problems that people are faced today. How well, come you have it in your refrigerator? How can we have this? Even though it does say uh, partially hydrogenated um, canola oil, I, I believe we asked a question of a professional if hydrogenated canola was okay because it's canola, and we were told that it was. Erroneously, obviously. Right. So now that we know that, this will no longer be in our refrigerator. No. But in, uh, in fact, we so can just throw it out. Yeah. Yes. It's amazing to find that hydrogenated oils or the incorrect oils are in nearly everything. Everything. That's why you don't want any packaged food, any crackers, uh, uh, saltines, or whatever. Right. You definitely don't want any potato chips. You don't want anything that comes in a package. My patients come from all across the country and sometimes foreign countries. And I've not yet had a single patient come to me whose physicians have placed them on fish and fish oil supplements or flax or flax oil supplements. We've been putting our patients on it since 1988 and recommending they stay on it indefinitely. But this is not general practice of medicine. Very few patients are placed on fish or omega-3 products. One place in the U.S. where they have begun to implement the Omega diet in cardiovascular care is at St. Luke's Hospital in Houston, Texas. From the cafeteria to the patient tray line, the hospital's menu now centers around the good fat diet. This is some of the items that we'll have available for our patients today on our patient tray line. And Terry Dildy, our clinical nutrition manager, has been working very closely with me. She's been teaching me about this omega diet. I think the big change that we've had is drawing away from the thinking that low fat is the healthiest and getting everyone, the chefs included, into using healthy oils freely. It's not necessary to be fat free. In fact, we're improving the taste by oh. adding some fat. That, I think that was a difficult concept yeah. for chef to That's grab been a, a shift. Hold of. That's been a shift. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that shift is well known the general population. A lot of people still say, oh, I eat low fat, and uh, think that that's a good thing, but it's the kind of fat, actually. Exactly. Mr. Billy. How you doing? Hi. I'm Amy. I'm the dietitian. I have some information here. This is what we recommend uh, for patients with high cholesterol and heart issues and um, also hypertension, which I know you have a touch of as well. Correct. The monounsaturated and omega-3 fats, those are the ones that are good for you that we want to keep in your diet. To get a good amount of fish oil, which is an omega-3 fat, mm -hmm. salmon, tuna, mackerel, herring, trout, and sardines, if you can eat those three times a week, that'd okay. be great. Again, we're going to be replacing some of the things that you have been eating. Okay. Right. So if you think about, I can eat this instead of eating maybe so much red meat, we're giving you something to eat instead of just saying don't eat this. Sure. Okay. I'm going on vacation and that's what we're going to have to mackerel and trout. Plenty of fish. Okay, good. Very good. The prevalence of omega-3 in our ancestral diet could be observed almost to the present day in regions of the world where old ways held on a little harder. It was in places like this Greek fishing village and the frozen expanses of Greenland that scientists got to observe firsthand the beneficial effects of good fat on the human metabolism. The story of omega-3 fatty acids as related to cardiovascular disease came from observations made in Eskimos. Two Danish investigators, Olaf Bang and Jorn Dürber, discovered that uh, the diet in Eskimos may be protective from cardiovascular disease because of the high content of these uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And what were they eating? They were eating a high fat, high cholesterol diet because it was largely from seal, polar bear, fish, walrus, and so on. So it was obvious they didn't have any plant foods uh, to eat. So they ate what was available and yet they were healthy. They had less cancer, they had less diabetes, and they had less coronary heart disease. So this seemed to be a healthy diet. 
Today, even the Eskimo don't eat the way they once did, but we can learn from them and find ways to add omega-3 back into our diets. We now developed a patient diet order called the Omega Diet. And on this um, particular diet order, the patient's foods will include um, a lot of uh, emphasis will be on vegetables. We we'll use the healthy oils in food preparation. Um, fish is offered more often on the Omega Diet menu. We also offer small individual bottles of olive oil on the Omega Diet. So it, it does separate it out from the other patient uh, menus. The Omega 3s also have a marked influence on the heart and muscle cells themselves. When the cells contract, the action potential stimulating this, the omega-3s have an influence on that, and they markedly reduce the irritability of the heart muscle. In other words, they reduce abnormal rhythm problems, and this has been shown to have a dramatic reduction in sudden death. Everybody's heard of sudden death in coronary disease where the heart suddenly fibrillates and they die. And consumption of omega-3 products has had a profound effect, reducing sudden death 50, even up to 70 percent. In Portland, Oregon, Dr. William Connor and his staff are studying various aspects of omega-3 fatty acids. Sudden death occurs in our population, about 300,000 people a year die suddenly, and they die because, largely because of coronary heart disease, uh, fatty deposits in the arteries, uh, along with abnormal blood clotting and the heart cannot produce output uh, to the vital organs like the brain. So people collapse, fall over, faint, uh, and if they aren't resuscitated within a few minutes, uh, they die completely. My name is Carly Moore, and I'm with um, the fish oil study, the research study. My heart can get to be over 300 times a minute, and um, I have a defibrillator. And I've been doing this now for about three months or so now and I felt really good so, so far. So. Unfortunately as with any medication the, the anti-rhythm medicines have a lot of potential side effects and people don't tolerate them as well as maybe we'd like. So if fish oil helps it sure would be nice because there's no side effects. Yeah exactly. So. If the fish oil, the, the omega-3 fatty acids do decrease the number of rhythms in people like Carly that would be wonderful. But uh, the more broader concept is, if in people like Carly, it can be shown that the rhythms are decreased without uh, threatening her because she always has the backup device in place. But if it shows that it, it decreases the kind of rhythms that we know are associated with sudden death, that we could then apply it much more broadly. Carly was resuscitated. 499,000 plus are not resuscitated. Hundreds of thousands die suddenly of heart attacks, and millions more are at risk for not just heart disease, but diabetes and inflammatory disorders like Crohn's disease and arthritis. Millions more whose dietary choices are often limited to foods redolent in omega-6 and trans fatty acids. We have a food supply where the omega-6 are in very high amounts throughout the food chain, uh, whereas, for example, in the traditional diet of Crete, which the omega uh, diet is based on. The omega-3 fatty acids are found in the milk and in the cheese and in the eggs so that if you make pasta with eggs and milk that pasta contains omega-3 fatty acids. While there are many Mediterranean diets, it was in fact a modified diet of Crete that the groundbreaking Lyon heart study was based on. The study showed compelling evidence that omega-3 is good for our hearts. But even here in America, the raw materials for an omega-3 rich diet are still readily available. In fact, they are as plentiful as weeds. And down there, let me see. That is purslane. Oh, is this, it really? this one is purslane. You know, we all, try. This is all purslane here. Oh, is it? And right here now. Wonderful. You, you can actually see, let me just pick it up. Yeah, we should pick up some. Contains I'll, the highest amount of omega-3 fatty acids than any other green leafy vegetable. You have them so all over it, the place growing. Had it all this time and didn't realize it. Yeah. We're, we're trying to grow it and couldn't grow it from seeds. That's a riot. Of course, most of the food gathering that we do these days doesn't take place in our backyards. People have a lot of uh, choices to make every day when they go to the grocery store especially. Uh, a lot of foods appear to be very healthy because they are low fat. For example, 
a lot of people feel like blueberry muffins are a very healthy food because they have blueberries in it and generally they're not fried, they're not a donut. But this muffin is full of hydrogenated fat. It's also a refined flour product. So the only thing good in it <laughs> is going to be the, the blueberries themselves. So to make a decision, we do want to choose low-fat products whenever the products are made with hydrogenated fat or saturated fats. For example, crackers, um, they usually are made with hydrogenated fat. So in that case, you would want to choose a low-fat product. Otherwise, try to choose a whole grain product whenever possible and choose one that has a healthy kind of oil. Beyond the epidemics of heart disease and obesity, the absence of essential fats in the human diet may be making itself felt in other areas of human health. Brain disorders like depression, bipolar disorder, even schizophrenia seem to be going along the same lines in that that balance between omega-6 and omega-3s has to be maintained. And we're now out of balance and we're seeing increases in rates of all these disorders. Major depression is the world's greatest source of disability. More people lose years of productive life and function due to depression than to any other illness. More than infectious diseases, more than tuberculosis, more than AIDS. Bipolar disorder used to be called manic depressive illness. It's a biological brain illness uh, where patients or people, they have mood swings, often up into something called mania, where their mood is either euphoric, high, or often irritable, combined with increased energy, decreased need for sleep. Uh, they might get impulsive behaviors like spending sprees, yelling at people they wouldn't normally yell at, things like that. And that alternates with depressive periods, with low mood, low energy, trouble concentrating, usually increased sleep at that point. And it's, uh, it can be uh, terribly dangerous. Between 5 and 25% of these patients kill themselves or die from accidents or, or other reasons because of this, this disorder. And the incidence of these depressions have been markedly increasing over the last hundred years. No one has found a satisfactory answer as to why that is. Not only is the prevalence going up, that is more people are getting it in the population, but the age of onset is decreasing. So kids are now getting depressed and manic. Where we didn't used to see that as much before. It isn't simply because we live more in cities. It isn't simply because we live more stressful lives. And one possible reason may be that we have radically altered the composition of our brains by radically altering the composition of our diets. In every decade of the 20th century, there was an increased rate of both bipolar disorder and depression. And there may be other factors for that. Um, substance abuse, breakdown of the family, the effect of technology and stress but it actually matches the decrease in omega-3s in our diet uh, very well. Dr. Andrew Stoll of Harvard University has done pioneering studies into the effectiveness of omega-3 in the treatment of mental illness. At McLean Hospital outside Boston in the late 1990s, he initiated a series of double-blind studies that seemed to show definitive results. This is what's called a survival curve. This is time on the horizontal axis here after four months, and this is the percentage of people that stayed well in the study or responded to the omega-3s. The red line here are the people that got the omega-3 and the green line are the people that got placebo. Every time the line drops is somebody getting sick again. And you can see how horrible the uh, placebo patients did. By two months, almost half had gotten sick again. Whereas about the four months of the study, only two out of the 14 omega-3 subjects got sick during the trial. This was a really dramatic difference that was clinically apparent to us. The study was supposed to run nine months, but we cut it off early, mainly because of that finding. Uh, some people were just reborn, uh, people that had failed other medicines before, um, just, just really turned around. I remember before I started the research with you, I remember getting up or in bed, and it felt like I was at the bottom of the ocean in the sense of tons and tons holding me down. I remember walking, and it seemed like my legs weighed a ton. No, believe me, everyone thought I was um, lazy. You came to our, our research study. You were, yeah. I think, our first patient that got yeah. omega-3 fatty acids. Right. So the study we did was double-blind placebo yeah. control, which means you didn't know what you were getting, did. and we didn't know what you were getting until no. after the study, but you had a you kind of guessed you were yeah, getting um, the real fish well. I noticed that um, there was a change in me.
first it was gradual, and my friends kind of noticed it. And the first thing they said is, what kind of new meds are you on? Maybe you better stay out of... I don't know, it had an effect. Help the medicines I was taking not have such a side effect or something. And also, I have a difficult time sometimes thinking about just how bad the severity of the depression really was. I remember one time coming to you a few years later saying, oh, I'm like cured. <laughs> and then I stopped taking the meds yeah. and went back. The omega-3 was probably the best substance I had in my body. I will be discussing the emerging protective roles of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids in depressive and aggressive disorders. Dr. Joe Hiblin is an officer in the U.S. Public Health Service and a scientist working at the National Institutes of Health. He is part of a team that is studying the role of omega-3s on aggressive and depressive disorders. The other set and category of illnesses that I think are very fundamentally important uh, with regards to omega-3 fatty acid intake, low intake, is the emergence of aggressive and violent disorders. For example, in Japanese students, uh, Tamihito Hamazaki gave them one gram of DHA a day and found that it, me it reduced measures of hostility. And that's remarkable because this is a population that's already eating a lot of fish. We're very interested in studying the role of omega-3 fatty acids in alcoholics. One of the fundamental findings here is that chronic alcohol use appears to deplete omega-3 fatty acids from the brain. This appears to be especially important in alcoholics, in part because they often are very aggressive and impulsive, both when drinking and when not drinking, and they also tend to suff suffer disproportionately from depressions and depressive disorders. So we believe that the loss of brain DHA in alcoholics is, is one of the uh, causes of some of the organ pathology, brain pathology, even more so perhaps in the liver, liver pathology. Not all alcoholics get liver disease or brain disease or you know, cognitive impairment. And what is different about the alcoholics who get liver disease from the other alcoholics? Well, we know that it's not that they just drank more. People, that was the first thing that people ruled out. We, and, and my hypothesis has been that, well, it relates to the dietary differences. And one of those key differences is the omega-3 intake. Dr. Norm Salem leads the team at the National Institutes of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, a part of the NIH, where his research into the depletion of DHA, a form of omega-3, has been shown to have broad implications beyond the care and treatment of alcoholics. We're trying to, to decide how DHA, how having DHA or being deficient in DHA, this particular fat, affects learning and cognition. Animals that have DHA in their diet prenatally and immediately after birth their, their learning is better than animals that don't. We thought at first when we started that we had to use very subtle behavioral tests, very difficult kinds of tasks uh, in order to find that because in humans we, the evidence was that it only impacts optimal brain function. But we were a little bit surprised to find that uh, rat behavior was severely impacted by, in just about every measure we, we uh, looked at, by low brain DHA. This is a device where we can ask the rat questions based on odor, since that's their main sense of modality, like vision is for us. So I've placed the animal on the box here, and, it, and because of a training program that we've done beforehand, the animal knows that if he sticks his nose in this odor port here, he can receive water from this tube right here. And so depending on the odor presented, we train the odor so that this odor, odor A, will give them water, odor B will not. So he'll put his nose in this odor port and smell, and if he smells odor A, then he'll lick and he'll receive a reward. If he licks after odor B, he won't receive a reward, so gradually he learns to only lick when the reinforced odor is there. We've found that the animals with that, that are deficient in DHA have a harder time learning the tasks. They, they will spend more time sampling the odor, but then they will still make more mistakes. They do not do spatial tasks as well, like swimming to a find a platform. And one of the most remarkable differences we found is that when we take the platform away and see if the rat can remember where the platform was, the, def the omega-3 deficient rats swam randomly. They didn't remember a darn thing. 
so this would relate to humans in a sense that it would be better for the for the human child for their mother to be eating foods that are high in DHA and it's also better for them to receive either breast milk or infant formula that has DHA in it. For millennia, the only option for new mothers was to breastfeed as nature intended. In the 1920s, formula was developed for women who for any number of reasons were unable to. Though it was never meant as a replacement for able mothers, it became one for millions of women. Now, as studies have begun to show the importance of essential fats in human development, breastfeeding, which began a resurgence in the 1970s, has become even more highly recommended. And now some formula manufacturers have begun to introduce omega-3 to their mixtures. Eight centers throughout this country, one in Chile and one in England, uh, participated in a study uh, to see if the addition of DHA and arachidonic acid to breast to the infant formulas would produce first safety, babies would live just as well as otherwise, and secondly would have beneficial effects on the development of vision and uh, vocabulary and motor function. Uh, the babies uh, had better vision uh, than the formula fed babies, the babies performed better uh, with their muscles, and the babies had better vocabulary. 50, 80 years ago, some people might remember, the babies received cod liver oil, which among other things had not only vitamin A and D, but also provided omega-3 fatty acids. The present uh, level of work indicates that the balance between the omega-6 fatty acid and the omega-3 fatty acid has been modified in such a way that human milk composition is also changing. This is particularly true in America, where for a long time now, burgers, fries, hot dogs, and fried chicken have been the national cuisine. What accounts for our country's aversion to fish? Most American cooks do not know how to prepare fish. They overcook it, or they get fish which is uh, on the stale side, and it tastes terrible and has a fishy odor. Uh, so that's one of the things. We need fresh fish coming to market without uh, staying in the icebox too long, and we need uh, instructions as to how to fix the fish. Most Americans know fish only in the form of a fish stick. If you switched from a soybean oil diet to an olive oil diet and ate the same amount of fish in both diets, just switching from soybean oil to olive oil doubled the levels of omega-3 fatty acids in your body. And this is a very important consideration because it's, it would be much harder to double the amount of seafood uh, produced in the world's oceans or double the amount of, of farm-raised seafood. But what if no matter how well it's cooked or how fresh it is, you just don't want to eat fish? 25% of all Americans don't eat any fish whatsoever. And in those cases, supplements are beneficial. Uh, we have plant sources of omega-3s like the flax seeds and the walnuts. And some people cannot tolerate, they are not supposed to have nuts and seeds in their diets. So that, in, in those circumstances, I think fish oil supplements or flaxseed oil supplements are very useful. Omega-3 fatty acids can also be incorporated into the diet by adding walnuts to any of your dishes. Here we've added walnuts to our apple crisp. This is to replace the apple pie that was on our menus. Um, the apple pie has too many hydrogenated fats in it. We've removed the hydrogenated fats from as many dishes as we can, and we're replacing them with healthy oils. Could we get from plants and earth sources are called alpha-linolenic acid. What we get from fish and fish oils is EPA and DHA. You need 10 times as much of the plant variety, alpha-linolenic acid, to get the same effect as the fish oil variety, which is EPA and DHA. So you need to get your omega-3 fatty acids from the fish, and you get to get your omega-3 fatty acids from plants and walnut oil and canola. You need both varieties. Some people can't get fish. Uh, some people uh, don't like fish. Some people are allergic to fish. In, in that instance, the use of fish oil is a natural thing to use. And it is a food, too. The Eskimos put seal oil on their salad. They like the taste of, of seal oil. It is now possible to get omega-3 enriched products like eggs. For those who do not eat any animal products at all, it is still possible to add omega-3 to your diet if you know where to look. There are different types of vegetarians, of course. 
uh, for the very strict vegetarians, you, we recommend that they use canola oil, that they use olive oil, and that they use walnuts and flax seeds in baking or any other aspects of their cuisine. We just made this, it was in, in your book, is uh, some honey mm. flax meal bread. Oh, that's delicious, isn't yeah. it? Oh, and so Actually, that's, all you need to do is toast it. You don't even have to put anything on it. Yeah, yes, I flavor. like that very much. Yeah. If one takes flax oil and fish oil supplements, capsules, it does help. But if the person then goes out and consumes all these products with corn oil, corn oil, margarine, soybean oil, and all of these things, in a lot, to a great degree it tends to neutralize the effects of this omega-3. Uh, if you take omega-3, you do tend to improve the ratio of 6 to 3 intake, of course. But if you're going to do and take the omega-3 supplements, equally important is reducing the omega-6 intake. So now we know that the right kind of fat in the right amounts is good for us. Good for our hearts, good for our minds, good for our babies. But is there any such thing as good fat on our bodies? Obesity is obviously undesirable as it leads to chronic diseases like diabetes. But has our society gone a little too far with its mania for thinness? I think the body needs to be nicely proportioned with the right amount of fat and the right amount of muscle. And uh, our standards of beauty, of course, are dictated somewhat by Hollywood, which is an artificial environment. Perhaps we need to go back to the Greeks and we see the statues of Venus and Minerva, and uh, perhaps that's a better standard of beauty. The way you the composition of the is different depending on what you can use your own plate as a portion guide. Uh, your serving of food should be about one-fourth of the plate should be your protein food. Try to get two servings of vegetables on there, and that leaves one portion for your starch, your carbohydrate. This way, there's no way you can overeat with this many vegetables on the plate. If you concentrate on getting seven or more servings of fruits and vegetables every day, it's difficult to overeat. And for the huge percentage of Americans who are seriously overweight, there is still only one real panacea. Limit your portion size and exercise daily. Even for those of us who aren't overweight, daily exercise has many of the same beneficial effects as the consumption of essential fats and nutrients. When omega-3 is taken in conjunction with exercise, the effectiveness of both appears to be increased. The combination of the two produces what scientists call the anti-aging effect. We've studied athletes before and after they've been eating omega-3 supplements and we found that a, a profound difference occurs in the beat rate of the heart in these athletes not only at rest but most importantly while they're exercising at very high levels even over some hours their heart rate is lower and their blood pressure is also slightly lower quite dramatically the amount of oxygen that the heart uses and needs to use to perform a high intensity exercise is much reduced after omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, this has great implications in the aging process where as we get older the ability to deliver oxygen to our body and to our heart is often reduced. Physical activity in older people is particularly important to prevent the major health problems that older people experience. The kinds of physical activity available to older people are aerobic activity, which is probably best represented in later life by, by walking, strength training or resistance training, um, which is lifting weights or even better gardening, the pushing and shoving, that one might do in gardening. Balance, which is probably best seen in a traditional Chinese exercise called Tai Chi, which is, is proven to be an exercise which increases balance amongst older people. And fourthly, flexibility, ability to be able to stretch. As far as we can tell, flexibility improves well-being if, 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 if we can move when we are older. Uh, if we also uh, burn more calories uh, by aerobic activity, somehow our appetite is set more appropriately 
we eat the, the amount of food more relevant to our needs. As we get older, we suffer from many uh, chronic diseases and again to the, due to the fact that physical activity and fitness improve our uh, physiological function, we can uh, fight against many of these uh, uh, chronic diseases and actually delay the disability that these uh, the different diseases uh, can force upon us. We should and can start physical activity and physical training at any age. Uh, we have the, the same benefit of physical activity uh, when we start at the age of 20, 16, or 60, or 70. Bill Toomey holds the Olympic decathlon record to this day, but after he won the gold in 68, he got out of shape. His efforts to get back on track were derailed until very recently. I was a victim of something called a fat-free diet. What I did to myself was to really regress. I had the loss of energy, I had the loss of enthusiasm for life, but I regained it by just thoughtfully looking at day-to-day -day exercise, uh, the components of nutrition, and especially omega-3 recently, which has had profound effects uh, on, on a variety of things. And I just uh, would give a message to people that the most important thing you have is your health. And many people can invent reasons not to exercise. And there is no reason not to exercise. You should think of it like eating. You always eat, but you don't exercise. Think of exercise like a meal that should be done on a regular basis. The rewards are amazing. Your attitude, your lifestyle, as you age, you can be indifferent towards it because you continue to have energy, you continue to grow intellectually, and the message is eat well and exercise. fatty acids, they get right on every cell membrane in the body, they prevent the omega 3s from getting there, and they create all the problems that people are facing today. In fact, so, they just throw it out. Yeah.